Ladies and gentlemen, AMD's Frederick series of processors has captured the interest of many. Up until now, Intel have been the driving force in the high-end desktop solution, with users who do a lot of video editing, um, 3D work, or perhaps even want to run a lot of virtual machines and just need that level of performance needing to cough up and stick with Intel inside. But since AMD have confirmed the rumours and shown that Threadripper is indeed going to be a thing, with up to 16 cores, 32 threads, users are left with a couple of questions. My name's Paul, and in this Red Game to video, we're going to be attempting to at least answer one of them, although the other question, performance, is going to remain a mystery. So this information does come from a series of rumours slash leaks. And so, apparently... A 16-core, 32-thread Threadripper CPU is going to cost you 849 US dollars. To put that into any measure of perspective, that's roughly half of Intel Skylake X processors of the same caliber. In this video, we're also going to discuss AMD's Radeon Vega New Frontier Edition, because some leaks have appeared concerning the upcoming GPU on CompuBench, but we'll get into that in just a moment. So, as I said, pricing is always really the king. Yes, performance is of course important, but most folks just cannot be expected to drop $2,000, or even $1,500, or even $1,000 is an awful lot of money to put into a CPU. Sure, if you're using it for production value, in other words, perhaps 3D rendering or video editing, then yes, you do get tax breaks, but even so, it's an awful lot of money. So, when you think about it, AMD entering this market and being able to significantly undercut Intel is a thorn in the side. Let's be optimistic on the side of Intel for a moment, but let's also make the assumption that this pricing is correct. So, let's assume that Threadripper does cost $849. US dollars. Hell, let's actually account for price gouging. Let's assume it's $900. US dollars. Well, if that's the case, which is roughly half the price of Intel's equivalent CPUs, but let's say Intel has a, a performance advantage of, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and assume it's 20%. I'm not saying it is, I have no evidence to the contrary, I'm just making a case for Intel, a best case scenario. Even if it's 20%, that automatically discounts a lot of users wanting to go for uh, Intel's CPU if they are doing production. Why? Because you could potentially buy a couple of different uh, AMD setups for equivalent uh, pricing. And if you're building a small studio, for example, let's say you're a team of 3D artists or what have you, and you're building a small studio, this is certainly the way you're going to be going. Threadripper. To put it into any other context, you could certainly have enough cores to do video editing and rendering in a series of processors, or perhaps one virtual machine, and the other one perhaps do some gaming, which is definitely one interesting theory. So I guess the question for many is how are in, how are AMD able to do this? Well, according to the sources, once again, at bitsandchips.it, the Threadripper is costing AMD for the 16-core 32 thread, that's including, by the way, the dies, the packaging, and the testing, only around up to 120 US dollars. So, for those bad at math, that means AMD are making over $700 profit per chip. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why the hell are they selling them for that price then? Why don't they sell them at, like, you know, $200 and screw Intel really badly? Well, it's not really that they're making that in profit, because you have to, of course, count for multiple things. One is the testing and further improvements of BIOSes, drivers. And then there's the other thing, you know, research and development, because it's not like they're just making this product in isolation. First of all, they have to pay off the cost of actually developing the product, and then I'm assuming we all want a new Ryzen CPU, which is, of course, known as Zen Plus or Zen 2, depending on how you want to call it, and its successor, Zen 3, which AMD did discuss very briefly, albeit at the Financial Analyst Day. If this information is accurate, and it is a big asterisk there, because ultimately we don't have evidence that it is, and we don't have evidence that it's not, that's ridiculous, because once again, just to put some level of perspective, the i9-7960X costs 1700 
US dollars. That's almost a thousand dollars difference. That's an awful lot of change. There is, however, a small problem, and that is we don't know the price of the motherboard. All the user in question running bits and chips dot it said is a lot. A lot doesn't mean much. Like, is a lot $300, $500, $700? Unfortunately, of course, it's really down to the motherboard itself. If you have seen any of the motherboards running Threadripper, you'll see that it has a smorgasbord of I.O. Whether that be PCIe slots, whether that be RAM, whether that be the absolutely ginormous CPU socket, or general other interfaces such as, uh, I don't know, USB, SATA, M2, whatever. There is an awful lot of I.O. on this board. And that is not cheap. That costs a lot, not just to design, but also to manufacture. Basically, this thing is monstrous. So, I wouldn't be surprised, I'm not saying it will be, but it's possible these motherboards on the TR4 socket, to give it its proper name, are going to cost perhaps slightly more than Intel. But even if you make the assumption that it is a little more than Intel, let's say worst case scenario, let's give um, the absolute worst possible scenario, and say it's $100 more expensive than an equivalent Intel board. Hell, let's say it's $150 more expensive than an equivalent Intel board. If you're buying the high end, that still means you're saving an awful lot of money. There are some questions regarding performance that we could certainly start touching upon more in depth, but frankly, I would like to have samples out in the wild, and for not just wild speculation. I had actually teased the idea in my head of doing a couple of videos on X299 versus X399, which I'm pretty sure AMD chose that name purposefully, but it seemed kind of unfair on both companies to do that. There's just not enough information. And quite frankly, all I could tell you is the information and regurgitate a lot of information that we already kind of knew. I wouldn't be surprised if Intel have the clock speed advantage, which is a surprise to absolutely no one, but that doesn't necessarily mean or preclude AMD being very competitive across the board. Intel does have some advantages, such as the AVX512 extension set, although how frequently that will be used in the future and now, we just don't know. And there is one other uh, massive elephant in the room, and that is the clock speed of Ryzen could be slightly higher. We've all heard the rumours, perhaps, of the F9 Threadripper SKUs, and some of these have turbo frequencies of almost 4 gigahertz to plus 4.1 gigahertz, which is very impressive and also rather aggressive, especially considering that certain models, for example the 1998X, assuming that is the final name, is being touted to support XFR. So that's very impressive. Finally, for users who insist upon multiple graphics configurations, so for example two or three or four graphics cards, what have you, do remember that there are 64 PCIe lanes available, which means that unlike Intel, who essentially penalise you for going for lower level um, Skylake X processors, or God help you if you go for Kaby Lake X, you get full access to multi-GPU performance, which is definitely a bonus. I'm not saying that in a negative way, because ultimately I have not tested um, Skylake X yet, although apparently we are going to be sent aboard. I'm currently trying to figure out when that's actually going to be. Uh, a vendor has told us that they would like to send us an X... 299 board, but they're not actually sure when they're getting them to then send them to us. So obviously they can't give us a definite release date as yet. But there you go. So Intel may end up with the performance advantage. They certainly end up with the core advantage, which is somewhat ironic. And perhaps this does make sense if AMD's pricing is accurate with this. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt, save just for a second it is. Then it does make sense when you factor in the fact that was a really awful sentence that there are reports that AMD are now slashing the prices of Ryzen. And in fact, you can see it yourself. You can just go to Amazon.com or what have you, or you know Newegg, and just look at the prices of the Ryzen 7s, and they have been trimmed significantly. And that's obviously a good thing. If you're seeing $30 or $50 or what have you off of the price of a processor, 
It's generally a good indicator that their entire line needs to be cut in price to make way for this newer Threadripper. And obviously, if, for example, they're charging 500 bucks for the 1800X, but these newer processors are being introduced at a cheaper price, that wouldn't make sense to anyone. A cheaper price, but for more cores. It's just a bit finickety. Speaking of a bit finickety, let's bring up the other big piece of news today that a couple of you have already messaged me about, actually. And that is, well, CompuBench. So, CompuBench is a pretty well-respected benchmark utility, although it's not exactly indicative of game performance, but that's a different topic, has appeared and new uh, a Vega card, which is a new Frontier Edition, has appeared. Now, from what we can understand, it's running at 1600 MHz for a maximum clock speed and is only being detected with 4 GB of memory. Whether that's an error or not is down to you. It's possible that it's not detecting that memory correctly, it's possible it's a driver bug, or it's possible that AMD have disabled it, or it's a BIOS limitation, or maybe it's just a derivative of it. We just don't know at the moment, to be really frank with you. There is performance data available, and you can see that on screen. I've decided to put it up against a GTX 1080 Ti, and if you do that, you're going to say to yourself, holy shit, this card is getting absolutely trounced. This is true, it is. There are certain tasks that simply have not run, uh, have failed or not applicable. And even on tasks that do run, for example, facial detection, well, yeah, it's getting ruffle stomped. It's about 70% slower. But there are some caveats. First of all, is this even slightly the final version of the card? And by which, by which I mean, I don't mean that in terms of the hardware. I mean that in terms of the drivers, like what's going on with that. Are they perhaps tweaking something, what was going on with the rest of the system, and so on and so on. The second thing, and this is perhaps the most obvious, is that, well, it's not the gaming-orientated version of the card. I wouldn't be surprised, however, if 1600 MHz is not a hop, skip, and a jump away from the final RX Vega clock speeds. Let's be very optimistic, and this is bordering on, you know, La La Land and say that AMD managed to squeeze an extra 150 to 200 megahertz out. I don't think they're going to get much more than that, being really honest. So I do feel that Vega is probably going to top out around the 1700 mark. But obviously there are some possibilities that companies such as Asus or MSI or whomever are going to get hold of the board and basically put so much, you know, extra cooling and you know, cherry pick the best silicon and all this stuff, and there may be certain derivatives which run a little bit faster. But ultimately, um, I don't think it's too far away from the final clocks. This information, however, to me, should not be used as a benchmark. Instead, it should be used as a different thing. It should be used as a measure to tell us that Frontier Edition has reached essentially the final stage of development, and thus AMD, at least in theory, because theory, until we actually see it on store shelves, in theory, AMD should be keeping up on its promises that we will see uh, RX Vega appear when it when it was touted to be, and then, uh, sorry, a new Frontier Edition Vega to be released when it was touted to be, and then about a month later, we will finally see RX Vega. Whether it's going to be a disappointment, whether it's going to beat a GTX 1080 Ti, and really, to be honest, I feel it should, given how old it is. Uh, I mean the tie in that respect. Like The tie is based upon the Pascal architecture. And I'm not saying that the 1080 is slow or anything like that. I'm just saying that if you have a card released over a year later, assuming it costs essentially the same amount of money, I feel that it should outperform uh, NVIDIA. What I would like to see happen, and this is something I've said before in another video, I would ideally like to see... AMD beat uh, NVIDIA by, let's say, 20-30%. But obviously the problem is, from what we're hearing, AMD have no card for the Vega 11, or sorry, have no Vega 11s available. So essentially, the higher mid-range, let's say the equivalent of the 1070, is not going to be covered. Therefore, NVIDIA can drastically cut the prices of perhaps the GTX 1080, possibly the 1070, fit into that niche, 
give AMD the high end for a couple of months, several months, and then Nvidia can either release a refresh of Pascal, which I feel is increasingly unlikely, or better still, they release Volta, and then it's down to AMD, of course, to counter once again. That, in my opinion, would be absolutely amazing for customers. It would give folks on the high end a faster graphics card, because let's face it, if you do want to run 4K gaming, and you do want even multiple graphics cards, a couple of graphics cards, some games will absolutely really need, especially at higher frame rates, to at least two uh, two graphics cards, two GTX 1080 Ti's. So if you do offer folks a faster Vega solution than the 1080 Ti, and also, you know, for folks who don't want to plonk down several hundred dollars on a graphics card, cut the prices so that more individuals can buy a GTX 1070 and a 1080, and then, you know, that settles like that for a little bit, and then once again, NVIDIA perhaps can take the, the the flag and then AMD, of course, can then play catch up. That would be ideal. And then basically each, comp each company can take turns of being on the top spot. That to me would be ideal. But ultimately, we're going to have to wait and see. Hell, for all we know, it could be that Vega actually outperforms even uh, Volta. But obviously, we just don't know until we see final benchmarks. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.